back to um, hearing what uh, Dan Little um, has to say and what his journey has been. Um, what I should do first, though, is just acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and uh, pay my respects to um, elders past, present, and future. Uh, and yeah, as I said, looking forward to hearing all about Dan's journey. Thank you, Simon. And thanks for the opportunity to give this talk. It's sort of an interesting idea. I think it's actually nice now that we're all sort of moved into a new building as a way to reintroduce ourselves. Um, digging back through some of the stuff was a bit, uh, I don't want to say confronting, but it was it was interesting to say this. Um, so a lot of people have commented on the the title of the talk, and I think that'll become obvious in a bit why I chose that title. Um, I'll tell you a little bit where I'm from originally. I, I was born in uh, Mifflin Town, Pennsylvania, which is a um, sort of a pretty rural town. Uh, I had one, it was what I would call one traffic light kind of town. Uh, it was in the valley of the Tuscarora Mountains. It was really pretty. A very pretty place. It was a great place to grow up for being outside and um, my growing of the river. So we did a lot of fishing and playing in the river. Um, so parts of my family have lived in that area for seven or eight generations. So about you know, 250 years. Um, in Mifflin Town itself, there really wasn't much to it. It was historically a stopover on the Pennsylvania Canal routes which existed for a brief time in the 1800s. Um, and there was intentions to make it a, a stop on the railway line, but about six years before I was born, there was a hurricane in 1972 that flooded the entire area. And they, so they canceled the plans to kind of make it a railway stop, which um, as a result, Mifflin Town always kind of felt like it was a dying town. Like the there was one sort of industry there, which was a kosher chicken plant where they processed um, chickens. And um, it was a very pretty place to grow up, but uh, if you're a curious person, you really had to use your imagination to, um, because there really wasn't much in the way of stimulation growing up there, um, especially when it came to other people. Uh, so I spent a lot of time kind of imagining what life was like outside of the town. And on my first grade report card, there's a note there that says daydreamer. And I think that it was a negative um, at the time. Um, my mom worked at a factory that was sort of made like a, a nylon packaging strapping material that both my grandparents and great grandparents on my mother's side all worked at until it eventually closed in the um, early 90s. Um, my dad was in the army, um, and then he uh, he became like a door-to-door -door frozen ice cream pizza delivery man uh, before eventually becoming a, a, a an auctioneer. Um, so similar to Charles's talk, my my mother's side of the family uh, was kind of raised in an evangelical church, um, but my dad's side of the family wasn't. So there was a lot of kind of um, debate, especially for me thinking about, there's a lot of tension around people's beliefs and kind of morality. And, and there were discussions about that, but they weren't academic discussions by any means. Um, uh, so Midland Town, to give you kind of a sense of what it is, so I, I had a look at the election results for uh, 2016 and 2020, and it was 80% both times voting for Trump. Um, it also at one point had the highest COVID infection rate in Pennsylvania. Um, and some of the things I see coming out of there suggest that there's a bit of COVID denialism as well. So I would say it's a pretty typical American small town. <laughs> um, and it wasn't entirely devoid of stimulation, but it only kind of revealed itself sporadically. Um, so I had, I had a group of friends that I was close with all through primary school and high school, and they were, um, a part of what was called the gifted program or the AP program. I wasn't, but I was allowed to tag along. And so we got to go and like play around with computers and do little projects and things like that. And it got me out of class and I really enjoyed um, doing that sort of thing. It was, um, it was kind of like, it was nothing really structured, but we were given kind of free reign without much supervision. And that later, of course, kind of uh, got some of us in trouble. So I, um, at one point, I had got the administrator 
written passwords to when I was in typing class and got caught kind of messing around in the, the system uh, and got called to the office where I was threatened with hacker on my permanent record. Um, one of us had, had bought uh, some sort of anarchist cookbook adjacent set of pamphlets out of the back of a magazine and it, it described uh, how to um, do phone freaking, which I don't know if you know what this is, but you can kind of play tones over the telephone line or, and it taught you a lot about how the telephone system works and we engaged in a bit of that uh, curiosity and boredom. Um, in high school, I did, um, I completed a lot of college, what was called college prep courses, um, which was a lot of math. Uh, so geometry, trigonometry, calculus, advanced calculus, um, advanced bio and chemistry. And I think by the time I finished high school, I was sort of sick of, of all of the kind of sciencey subjects, which played a role in kind of what I ended up studying when I eventually went to university. Um, I was also interested a lot in literature. Um, in high school, I was voted the most quietest. Um, I, I volunteered at the library and read a lot. Uh, my sister and I are actually the first in my family to go to university. Um, she ended up finishing before I did, I guess, because I, I never left. Um, and also due to the kind of circuitous route that I took in completing various degrees. Um, after high school, I didn't start university immediately. I took a year off. Um, my family had moved from Midland Town um, to another town uh, called um, Bloomsburg, um, where my, my dad had taken a promotion. So the whole family moved, and I thought I would move with them and just work for a year, which I did. But I eventually enrolled at Shippensburg University, which is a, a, what I'd call a small liberal arts college. Um, has about 7,000 undergraduates. Um, I mainly applied here because uh, I, I knew some people who went there, some of my friends went there. Uh, they were doing computer science. I had applied uh, as a fine arts uh, major. Um, I had won the art honor in my senior class. Um, but before even arriving at university, I totally lost confidence in my ability to like, do any sort of art. So I, for some reason, switched my major to psychology, and I'm not exactly sure how I ended up doing that. But I think it was in part because I had kind of no exposure to it. I had done, uh, I had done math. I'd done some a bunch of science classes. I had really never, outside of media, I really didn't have any exposure to psychology. And there was a lot of mental health issues in Midland Town, and um, but they were kind of dealt with in an idiosyncratic way that it showed a, a distrust of science and medicine and those sorts of things. Like doctors were sort of venerated, but any kind of mental health issue was not. Um, in some cases, they were treated as like a matter of faith, which was uh, a sort of something that really didn't make sense. I like, had read about some of these things. I think I even read um, some of the book by Richard uh, Steinberg on since the at some point. Um, and, you know, psychology seemed like it might offer some insight into those kind of strange contradictory behaviors that people engaged in around where I grew up. Shippensburg was great. We had a lot of really interesting classes. Um, I did a world history class of the sort that was like, well, hey, everything you learned in high school is wrong. And that was like, okay, this is great. I love this. Um, my biggest regret was you had to do these two geography courses. And I thought, well, I'm going to do that now in my freshman year, and I'll save the good courses for later. Little did I know I wouldn't be there later to actually do the good courses, so I ended up doing like a three-hour geography class that was like 6 to 9 p.m. on Wednesday. Um, psychology was really great, too. A big contrast with the Australian way of teaching psychology, I found out later, is that the U.S. intro to psych class was a lot of Freud and a lot of uh, kind of historical psychology which I liked was good. Um, I liked the statistics classes and I really liked participating in the experiments. And I think this was, I um, was trying to remember some of the experiments I did and I'm pretty sure that somebody was replicating the barge kind of a, a elderly priming study and then monitoring how you walk down the hallway because I, I have a vague recollection of participating in an experiment that was like that. And I went to see if it had been published and I, I couldn't find anything. Um, so it's probably like an early sign of uh, replication crises. But I think that was the first time I made the connection that somebody got paid to 
do like think up experiments and like they seem pretty interesting at me. Um, in So 1999, I abruptly dropped out of university and I moved to Perth with my girlfriend at the time. Um, this is my the first time I'd ever been on an airplane. It was a very long haul flight from, um, I think they left out of JFK and flew to Perth. Uh, I, I had a single suitcase. I didn't know how, I had really hadn't made any plans for how long I was going for or, or what was going to happen, but it seemed like a good idea to try to get far, as far away from the town as I could. And I worked out the distances, and it's about you know, half there on the way. Um, so I really didn't give much thought to what I was going to, like what my university career was going to uh, be in Australia. Um, I had a notion that I was going to return to studies. And I was pretty devastated when I found out that, oh, actually, I'm an international student now. I have to pay fees to attend university. And I, I was really naive. I had no idea. I, I lined up at UWA sort of a few months after arriving to enroll. And they're like, well, you have to pay you know, X thousands of dollars to attend. So, like, well, there's no way I can do that because I don't have any money. Um, so instead, I, I just I worked. Um, I got a job. Uh, I. I got a job as a telemarketer for a while for the Dennis Lilly Foundation, apparently as a cricketer. Um, and that's the only job I've ever been fired from. Um, <laughs> if you can imagine a, 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 an American, somebody with an American accent trying to collect funds for the Dennis Lilly Foundation, um, it didn't go over too well. I got laughed at a lot. Um, I, I worked at a small business that made big stained glass windows for a bit. Um, uh, and I worked at a petrol station, but I also kind of, I kept doing experiments as a participant. I would go to universities and see what experiments they could do. I did one experiment at Murdoch University where I was given a, a placebo and they had wired me up with um, electrodes and I had to answer uh, multiplication problems. And they were sort of like three digit, five digit, three digit multiplication problems under time pressure. If I had too many wrong or took too long, it would shock me. And I had to rate how long it would, um, and like how painful it was and how uncomfortable it was. And it was great. I, I thought it was I thought it was really, really um, fun. I, I at UWA I did uh, I did some attentional experiments and I did some things involving the um, Ravens progressive matrices, which was kind of my first exposure to that sort of stuff. Um, and then eventually I uh, after two years I received permanent residency and I was able to enroll in university and defer my um, uh, fees for that. So I was working night shift at a petrol station and I didn't realize it at the time. I would only find out later that I'd, I'd only briefly missed Mike Kalish being at the University of Western Australia who would become kind of pretty influential to my early career. I only briefly missed kind of Tom Griffiths being at um, uh, UWA as well. Um, and, and both of those uh, People would end up having a pretty big influence on me through their connection to Steve Rogas, who would later become my PhD advisor. And there were there were a few things that happened at that point when I enrolled at, in university that kind of had a big influence on my later career. Um, and it proved to be pretty important. So there was so I, I was able to kind of get credit for what I had done. So I had a year of university. So I was enrolling in second year. Units. But due to the way the UWA structured their psychology subjects, one of the units was a full year subject, and you couldn't enroll in halfway through the year. And I had just done permanent residency and was really excited, but it was midway through the year. So I had to take all of these electives to fill up the time. So I did things like linguistics and ancient history and uh, macroeconomics and uh, computer science and computer science, where they, they taught us how to program in a language called Haskell. Which I've never seen anywhere else. It had a lot of recursion in it, but it was really fun. Um, I really enjoyed kind of learning how to do that. And then I set it aside and really didn't think about it until for a few more years. Um, I was sort of at the time uh, trying out different subfields of psychology and seeing which ones I was really interested in. I, I thought at first I was going to be interested in social stuff because I really liked the idea of in-group and out-group. Um, uh, prejudice that seemed to really kind of apply to my previous experiences. 
explaining, you know, why, you know, what's up with their kind of weird and strange behavior. Um, um, I think I'm always trying to explain kind of small town just life in some way, and that seemed to be a good fit for it. But I, um, in third year, in, in UW, they had these classes that were essentially like a capstone project, but they ran for the entire year. You met every week and discussed papers, and you conducted a kind of independent experiment. And we did something, like my group did something on implicit prejudice, and it didn't work out, and there were tons of confounds. I thought, this is going to be really hard. And social sex can be a bit tricky to get answers in. Um, I really, I, I thought that maybe neuropsych would uh, kind of be another avenue, but I got really bored when I was in areas of the brain, um, and that, that was kind of a turn off for me. Um, and in third year, I took a cognitive psych class that was taught by Kim Kersner um, on the left and Steve Landowski on the right. And Kim lectured, did a few lectures on skill acquisition and talked about um, kind of contrasted actor and uh, instance theory. And um, I remember coming across one of Gordon Logan's papers on instance theory, this one in particular. It had equations in the introduction. And this struck me as, I was like, why, you know, okay, I understand in the results section when you're doing statistics and things like that, that makes a lot of sense, but I don't understand why there are equations in the intro of this paper. Um, I had sort of come across some, a similar idea before in, in the second year of stats class, we had done an experiment on the Sternberg paradigm, but all of the theory was kind of cashed out in the two-way ANOVA. So that was, again, just statistics. Even though it kind of did this neat thing of telling you how people were uh, uh, scanning through their memory, it wasn't the same. Like I didn't have to understand the math to understand the theory. So I, I thought, well, uh, this is very confusing, and I'm never going to understand this unless I actually try to do something with it. So I ended up approaching um, Steve to uh, see if he would supervise me in honors. Um, there was another thing that happened at this, um, there were two other things that happened. Um, so Steve was running this project looking at uh, misinformation around in, in the Iraq war, and so he was conducting this large survey, survey about weapons of mass destruction, people's beliefs um, across several countries. And, um, and it was probably one of the first projects he worked on that led to his current work on misinformation. And he uh, kind of recruited a bunch of RAs from the CogSight class uh, to volunteer and do things. So I did some data entry, and then he got us all together and gave us pizza and got a t shirt. Um, it was the, the Matilda Bay Institute for Simple Cognition because complexity is annoying. And I thought, I, I thought this is great. Okay, I love this. Um, I was pretty sold that research was what I wanted to do by that point. You know, I had taken three years out of my, you know, between high school and actually getting back into university. So I, I really was enjoying um, getting my hands dirty. Um, the second thing that happened was that in the Cox Science class, Steve presented two topics which I found really intriguing. Um, one was on um, ecological rationality, so the idea that cognition reflects sort of elements of the environment. And the second was knowledge partitioning, which was the idea that uh, people develop contradictory knowledge and where people can learn contradictory rules in different contexts and then access them without any kind of crosstalk between them, without any interference. So in a kind of standard experiment, like the bottom uh, left-hand graph, you train people that you know red objects follow one rule, green objects follow a different rule, and then during a transfer test, they switch between these rules based on the color of the object, which doesn't tell you anything about the actual category response you're supposed to make. But it, it, um, they, they use the context as a gate to pull out the particular rule. And this seemed like it had a lot of uh, kind of, this seemed perfect for looking at you know, the kind of types of contradictory behaviors and uh, kind of perplexing as a kid. Um, so I suggested to Steve, hey, why don't we do a paper, why, why don't we do an honors project like looking at ecological rationality of knowledge partitioning? And he said, yeah, that's great. That's a little big for an honors project. Um, why don't you do this other project that I'm doing with Evan Height, which had, was looking at um, uh, ad hoc categories and this idea called knowledge restructuring. So I, I thought, yeah, that sounds that sounds great too. Um, so in December, before I started honors, Steve ran this crash course uh, in MATLAB that covered, it ran for about throughout December. I think it was maybe one, maybe like a full week crash course. They covered how to use things like site toolbox for experiments. Um, it covered uh, kind of rudimentary parameter estimation, talking about the witness model, and 
So I, I, I felt like I had a bit of a leg up on other people doing this crash course because who were his like PhD students because I had done this intro to computer science course and had this background, this very minor background. So I had a familiarity at least with things like for loops, variables and arrays and things like that. And I, so this was in December, you know, honors didn't start for a few more months and Steve let me set up in his lab, which was this asbestos shed that sat off the main building of psychology at UWA. And it was sort of just, it was all by itself. There was no kind of interference from the outside world. You could just go in there and do whatever you wanted and just be, you know, I, I, if you've told, heard the story before, that's very right long. Um, but we, I, everything I know about cricket, I've learned from this lab cricket game that we played with golf clubs and tennis balls, where we, we had all of these pools that hit out the door, that was six. If it hit the wall and the fool that was out, um, it was it, you can only play it in the hallway of the garden science lab. It was the only place to fill all the pools. Um, it eventually got torn down, which was good because it actually wasn't you know, expensive. Um, so during that period, I, I immersed myself in MATLAB, read the MATLAB manual cover to cover, kind of set about programming my honors experiment. Which by the time honors started, I kind of had a working prototype of the experiment, um, which was a really great experience. Uh, it was it was really great to be trusted to kind of be in a lab and be around other people who are doing similar things, um, and be able to kind of feedback ideas off of them without the kind of uh, you know needing to be graded on it, I guess. Um, so Steve also lent me uh, a book by Jeff Hall, Perceptual and Associative Learning. Which is where I, I started learning about the um, Rasporla Wagner model. And over the course of my honors project, I, um, I did some categorization experiments. The idea behind the experiment was that we would train people um, to categorize sets of words into arbitrary categories. The, but unbeknownst to the participants, the categories had an underlying structure, which was um, formed by these ad hoc categories, things like uh, they were. Uh, things that you take from a house that's on fire, things that can fall on your head, things you see in a police station, and things you see in a metro station. And to kind of track what people were doing, we swapped one of the items between categories. And when, what we found was, quite reasonably, um, uh, people would learn to assign these anomalous items into the categories we reinforce until we told them what the real labels are, were, and then it depended on how much training they had. So if they only had a little bit of training, they would fall back on their prior knowledge. If they had a lot of training, they would tend to stick with what they had learned. So I, I um, wrote this model, which turned out just being a linear associated model, um, that uh, you could add a parameter that you could just boost the weights on some of the connections between some of the items to get it to restructure and shift the, those anomalous items around. Um, it took me a long time to do this, to understand how to do it. So Steve made an offhand comment once that I kind of, I, you know, I was pouring through the PDP books. I got the uh, basic ideas of how they worked. I just didn't know how to program. And Steve made an offhand comment that the association weights are a matrix. So I was like, oh, okay. And then it was like a light bulb went off. And I went away and within a few days, they had to stay working. It did really nicely. Um, and then I took it to, um, EPC after the year after honors, which was what I presented it in Melbourne at the um, uh, Alan Gilbert building. And I was pretty happy with my talk. I thought it was a pretty good talk. And then at the end of my talk, uh, Daniel Navarro, who has had, because of this one comment, has had an outsized influence on the way I've gone about the rest of my career, pointed out that, yeah, that, that's, that's all right, but you know, there's a whole uh, mathematical language for dealing with prior knowledge. Why didn't you use that? And, and I thought, I thought at the time I had come across Bayes in, in sort of reading about this project, but it was way over my head at the time. This is sort of, this is 2004 when I did honors. So the, I, I think the, you know, the LSA handbook didn't come out until 2007. The topic modeling paper had just come out, but it was the, all of that stuff on the non parametric base stuff was way over my head. And. But that, that comment really stuck with me. And throughout my PhD, I really wanted to get my head around what was, you know, what was this phase stuff and how did it work and how did I use it. Um, so that comment, I think, 
like really drove, really kind of presented a challenge to me um, that I, I took to heart uh, throughout my PhD. Um, and then when I started my PhD, so I just, like most people in Australia, I just did my PhD in the same lab that I uh, did my honors in, which was with Steve Landowski, so it was a good lab, like he was uh, a good, an excellent supervisor to work with. Um, there are a few things that happened in the first part of my PhD, which I felt really lucky about, and they were mainly due to Steve's kind of connections and influence um, throughout the math side. One of them was in, I think it was either 2005 or 2006, there was the International Conference of Memory in Margaret River. That's where I met Simon Dennis. Um, I, there were, but there were a lot of international researchers, national researchers that I had introduced, been introduced to for the first time and spent a lot of time kind of studying their work afterwards. Um, uh, so just a brief aside, so Jim Townsend was there, he gave this talk on capacity where he turned around and was doing calculus on the whiteboard behind him. But he also at one point had taken the electric kettle and put it on the stove and they had to evacuate the hotel. <laughs> um, so Simon, I think you had given a, a talk on recognition memory and where you could use good sampling to um, estimate the posteriors. And I think the three hour drive back from Margaret River back to Perth, I picked your brain about good sampling. I'm not sure if you remember that, but um, it, it certainly made an impression on me. Um, so during, during university, I've been uh, supplementing my income working at uh, Video Easy um, as, as a, it was a video store that used to exist. I was Video Easy, Australian Video Easy employee of the year in 2004. <laughs> That's my kind of thing. Um, by this point, I knew I, I uh, like, I'd started my PhD with Steve. He had kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, I, I got a scholarship to do a PhD. I could quit my job uh, working at Video Easy. Um, and I, uh, part of what I was doing in my project was Looking at this idea, I finally got to study knowledge partitioning instead of knowledge restructuring. Um, so I, I did an experiment where we had a kind of probabilistic feedback across a continuous feature that was broken up according to two different um, into two different contexts. And we found that that uh, during a transfer phase, that there were two kind of groups of people, one group that sort of ignored context and just learned this kind of up-down. Uh, probabilistic feedback rule, and another group that really looked like they learned two different functions, one which increased and the other one which decreased. Um, I really, really wanted to model this using some sort of Bayesian representation. And I came across this paper, which might, might have been kind of circulating at a preprint, as a preprint at the time. And I, so I was essentially using things like a generalized context model or general recognition theory as kind of my approach to all of these things. But I, I, I was reading a lot of Danielle's papers um, and, and kind of pouring over the code that she put up on her website and you know, finding, you know, seeing, seeing if I could apply it to my studies as well. This paper I thought would really kind of um, Give me a shot at modeling this stuff, this idea of over hypotheses, where you're modeling not only what priors people have over the parameters themselves, but the types of, um, uh, I guess, in my case, the types of strategies that might exist over the kind of categorization space. I would say that um, Danielle eventually scooped me and published kind of a paper that uh, was looking at a kind of an ecological rationality of knowledge partitioning um, a few years uh, after this paper, but it was much better. To do anyway, so I was I was pretty pleased that somebody had done it. Um, another thing that happened at this point is I went to CogSci and the uh, Math Site conference that were in Vancouver. I think this is maybe where I met Charles because um, there were you were doing a lot of Bayesian workshops at the time with um, Josh Tenenbaum and Tom Griffiths, which I attended and really liked. I sort of had, was going back and forth between the conference and my hotel room and reading kind of um, Young and Pitt's paper on um, model comparison methods and trying to figure out like, how I could apply this stuff. I presented at Math Psych. It was the first talk on the first day. I had this really simple linear Q, like a Q, QE model that I, I thought the talk went well. 
And then the next talk was from Bossemeyer's quantum uh, model of cognition, which was just wall-to-wall -wall math, and really, you know, blew my mind about the the contrast between my talk, which is very, you know, simple cognition and complexity is annoying, and and Jerome's talk, which was very heavy. Um, So I, I eventually, sometime during the last part of my PhD, the kind of the base started to click with me, and it really didn't do it through kind of the standard way. It, it came about um, obliquely through um, thinking about minimum description length and, and uh, normalized maximum likelihood, and, and related ideas about complexity. So I was thinking about well, why would people develop um, a, a kind of a partition representation? And I thought, well, maybe what I can do is actually quantify the complexity of those representations somehow and get an answer to that type of question. And Jacob Feldman's work was really crucial here. Um, and, and, and Daniel Navarro again was publishing things on minimum description length along with the code that I, I was really, really into at the time. And um, so I read a paper by um, Feldman and his student on this kind of rectangle language where you could take a category space and think about the different ways in which you could break up the categories by filling it with different shaped rectangles. And then you could just use the combinatorics of the rectangles to get an idea of complexity. So the, the language that you were trying to minimize was uh, this rectangle language. And I thought, well, that's great, but my, my categories are three dimensional, so I need cubes. And um, they had only done the math for the, the kind of the four by four category space. So I had to, I had to generalize the math, which took me a long time, but I eventually did it. And at some point, I woke up in the morning and I understood quite a bit about sampling and, and probability distributions and how those were represented and, and how you could combine them with a prior to, to a posterior. And suddenly it just did click. I guess I've been reading so much about it and not understanding it that. I needed kind of this, um, what they call the kind of impasse and then the incubation period before it clicked. So I, um, the kind of main result from my PhD, or one of the most interesting thing, which I never published, was this uh, minimum description length analysis of knowledge partitioning and what's called the context invariant uh, strategy, um, which you could, you could represent using these different cubes and get a and quantify the complexity. And I did this across a number of different category spaces, and it didn't really work. The, the knowledge partitioning uh, space was always more complicated than in the context of variance space. So more on that in a bit. Um, not kind of running out of time. Um, so there was another critical thing that happened. I went to the Oscog Sci Conference in Adelaide in 2006. And if this hadn't happened, I may not actually have a group in psychology. So I needed to do some additional modeling. I had this, this uh, data on response times for a function learning study. Um, so I had, I had a, an end choice experiment. I needed a model of response times from end choices. This is 2006. So the LBA paper hadn't come out yet. And I found this obscure chapter by Rich Schiffering in the kind of boost shift, which presented this kind of hub and spoke model, uh, random walk. And I didn't have time to do some complicated diffusion analysis every day to do this model. I needed something with analytic results that I could just get like fit to the data and get answers out of. And so I, I found this. I went to the library, I got the book, I brought the book back, I coded it up and did the modeling very quickly. Um, and then I gave my talk at all spot site. It was a total disaster. The um, I it was at the Right after morning tea on the last day, everybody was going away to Barossa. Um, nobody came to my talk. There was one person in the audience when I started my talk. Everyone came in halfway through. No one really understood what I was talking about. And, and I left feeling pretty deflated. But, um, kind of like half a year later, maybe it was the end of the year, I went to the NASA conference in Canberra, and Shipman happened to be there. And I got to talking to Shipman and he mentioned that I I used this, and that somehow really impressed him. Like that, I, I was maybe the sole person who ever read this chapter, and he was really excited about it. And um, I it probably also had something to do with Steve talking to me behind the scenes. But the um, if he hadn't been, if he hadn't come to Mass, I hadn't sort of found that paper. I might like he offered me based on seemingly based just on that conversation. Um, 
the, in the invitation to come to Indiana and do a postdoc. And that, that sort of has determined the course of my career since then. Um, so there, there seemed to be like kind of a really absolute minimum amount of paperwork to, for this postdoc to come on as well. I think I just sent an email and they're like, yeah, come over. And I have no idea how that happened. I feel very privileged and very lucky. Um, because going to Indiana as a categorization researcher was really, really exciting. Uh, everything I had been reading, uh, or at least you know, eighty percent of the stuff I've been reading during my PhD had been written by somebody who was working or had some associated association with Indiana. So I was, I, my roommate was Dave Sewell. Um, we used to be here, um, so we, we shared an office during my PhD, and we we would just kind of make freely associated stories about people who were working in Indiana that we had vague ideas about because we were so isolated at Perth. We had no exposure to anyone. We just knew them through their writing and kind of, we would dissect author notes. Sometimes people would say funny things on, in the author note or on their website, give us an indication about their personalities. So going there was really, really excited. It was really, um, I was really excited. I had read lots of Mazowski's papers during my PhD. I um, asked him to be my uh, postdoc advisor. And um, yeah, he, I think he had reviewed some of my papers, and I knew that he had liked at least one of them, so that seemed like a good idea. Um, and I thought that was pretty generous because at least some of them was challenging the, the GCA. And through that, through working with him, I, I came across, and then I, I, I sort of, through Nizovsky, I started working on ideas that were, came out of Jim Townsend's lab and the collaboration that they were working. I didn't actually meet Jim Townsend until I was until the last week I was at Indiana. I didn't spend any kind of time um, associated with it. But um, that kind of work with Nazowski was um, important because it, it, it sort of introduced me to the idea of uh, information processing and modeling response times more directly. And kind of the first day or two that I was there, I mean, he had sent me this paper where they had looked at. Um, Applying systems factorial technology to integral and separable dimensions in categorization and show that for integral dimensions they were included the whole objects, but for separable dimensions people seem to process the um, dimensions independently of each other. I made some offhand comment about that, about that sort of uh, the ideas in that paper. And that led to this whole project of applying SFT to recognition memory, which we never published, but I spent a year and a half kind of collecting data and trying to refine this experiment. Um, it really sort of, like Nozovsky was somebody I, I, I truly admired coming out of that process because he, here he was trying to falsify his own model and he, we, the amount of revision we spent on designing experiments was just uh, heroic. But it also gave me an idea then about why kind of the knowledge partitioning uh, representation might be more complicated than the context invariant one. And it had to do with the fact that, well, people aren't just accessing the entire representation. What they're doing is, is processing parts of the stimulus to access parts of the representation. So if you've thought about what the, you know, really the knowledge partitioning representation should be divided by two, and which would make it simpler than the context invariant representation. And here's some kind of mouse tracking data um, from an experiment that I ran, which showed that in fact, you know, what people do is they check the context and then they check something else. Um, they check whatever feature, they switch which feature they're checking next based on the context. So they're kind of working through the, um, a, a smaller part of the representation. So that really kind of uh, gave me a, a huge interest and a focus in information processing. And, and that's sort of that, um, where I've, the research I've done since then. Um, my other supervisor was Rick Schifrin, and he had this idea that um, I guess it was sort of like just a thought he had about, well, you know, isn't it interesting that, that if you had a scatter block, people can interpret that scatter block different ways. And that led to this whole project looking at uh, Gaussian processes, which is a non parametric um, Bayesian method. And at one point, I must have been one of the few people working on this because every time I went anywhere, people asked me when I was going to publish this Gaussian process work. I think Chris Lucas was possibly one of the only other people working on this, along, along with uh, Tom Harris. Um, this whole project was really complicated because um, Richard misunderstood something about how you combine kernels. He kept trying to get me to do it in an incorrect way. 
But it took like six months to sort of convince him that I know you can't, you, that's not how this works. You can't do it that way, which I didn't know at the beginning. I had to sort of work through it as well. And Rich didn't really care if we published this or not. Eventually, I did write a paper and submit it, but it um, got a revised resubmit, I think, to cognitive science, but I haven't gone back to it yet because it's fairly complicated. Um, I started applying for jobs in 2009, um, and all of the positions were, that were available were at, at Ivy League schools, and it was really competitive, and I didn't get any interviews. But I got an interview at Melbourne, and I think during that period I, I had flown back for the job interview, then back to the US, then I flew back um, for Christmas to visit my partner's mom who lived in Perth, then I flew back again. Um, and then I flew back in February for the uh, Australian Mass Life Conference in Perth. But by that time, I knew that I got the job at Melbourne. For some reason, when I came to give my job talk, I, I had all this really interesting work with Mazowski. I think we had two psych review papers that were in press or very nearly in press. And I chose to talk about the Gaussian process stuff. Uh, I think it was because it was the, the more complicated thing and the thing that I was really spending most of my time thinking about. And, and I'm really lucky that they were hiring lots of people at that particular period of time. Um, because I'm not sure how well I explained it. I look back at the talk and it was really, it's like, it was, it was, you know, nothing was incorrect, but it was definitely not very clear. Um, I did show a lot of pretty pictures though. Although just, um, so then I came here and I had the opportunity to set up my lab, the Knowledge Information and Learning Lab, where um, I think I summed up pretty well in the initial blurb that I wrote about what my key questions are. Um, so how does knowledge influence how we perceive and interpret new information? How do we develop knowledge through experience? And how does our knowledge affect our decisions and behavior? I think that does describe pretty well what I'm interested in. Um, so the lab used to be in the Redmond Berry Building. Uh, I shared the lab with peers. This is what our students thought about our joint lab meetings. Um, peers are on the left. I'm, I'm on the right. Um, this seems to be kind of every lab meeting, I think, in those first few years. Um, I have continued to apply some vectorial technology to looking at different feature representations. I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit because I want to just talk about one thing that um, uh, came out of that particular work, which was that um, I had all of this data from looking at these categorization experiments with lots of different features. And I knew kind of what, how people were processing these features because the, the system vectorial technology gives you that information. But embedded in those experiments was this other idea that had to do with um, whether or not people had to apply one rule or two rules. And there's this whole other set of machinery that system vectorial technology has that looks at kind of changes in workload and changes in capacity, but it's usually looking at uh, if you have multiple stimuli presented versus a single stimuli presented, you have to detect them. So I thought, well, let's apply that to this idea of kind of applying multiple rules, because this seems to be getting this idea of complexity, which I probably really liked previously. But when I tried it, it didn't work at all. Like uh, we had, you know, we, I was working with Ami um, Adels, and um, we, you know, applied this to our data sets and we had coactive models, which were very limited in capacity, serial models, which had super capacity, none of it made any sense. And then we eventually worked out that uh, it had to do with the fact that we had these distractors presented as well. So we, we spent a lot of time, several years working on that, and eventually it kind of made its way into the camera of systems vectorial technology. Um, I'm gonna kind of stop there, I think, because I don't to talk too much. Uh, but I do want to um, thank my um, colleagues uh, and also my lab, uh, who've been a kind of key part in my career here in Melbourne. Uh, that, the picture in the top left was one of the first uh, lab parties that we had, and we invited a lot of other labs. Um, so I think Piers is there, Simon Cropper is there, Meredith is there. Um, and eventually we had to stop inviting them because the lab itself got too big and we couldn't fit everyone in my house. Um, but, I, but they they have like working with my students. Uh, they've been a key part of of this work. I think like most of the second half of these um, kind of projects were led by them, and um, it's been a, a kind of pleasure to work with all. So I'll stop there. Thanks very much.
So the, the, the PDP books, I think, were highly influential for me. There's a, the parallel distributed process of books by um, McClelland. And, uh, um, there was a... There, there is a book uh, by um, Jim Townsend and Greg Ashby called Stochastic Dynamic Modeling, I think is the name of it. Um, Stochastic models for psychological processes. I can't remember the exact title, but it, it, I, I spent a lot of time reading that because I didn't understand any of it. Um, and there's, I, I tend to do this thing where if I don't understand something, I was throw myself into it and try to get some traction on it. That was a book I spent a lot of time reading and study, um, especially during my PhD. Um, yeah, I have to have to think about what other what other books have been. Okay, sound very specific. Yes, yeah, they're, they're, they were usually pretty technical. Um, the I kind of the sort of broad picture of psychology and broad picture cognition stuff I liked, but it, it didn't it didn't inspire me in the same way that the more technical things that I couldn't fully grasp did. Okay. So you have to characterize where you think you're going next, research-wise. What? How would you do that? Uh, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> no, I did have a few slides at the end here um, that were on that particular issue. So I guess one of the things that, that came out of this kind of work was that, well, you know, when in categorization in lots of different paradigms that we do in the lab, it looked like a lot of features were processed serially. And that has implications for we think about how to scale up to outside of the lab. Because I, I'm constantly sort of trying to get back to that question of, well, how do I explain people's strange contradictory behaviors? And I can't really do that by looking at response times in the lab. I mean, I can do it in part, but it's just theoretical. It doesn't really get at the sorts of complex situations that people find themselves in. Um, so one of the questions that came out of that was, well, if features being processed serially, how do you, and we noted that there was a consistency in that some of them were processed first, usually. So something like um, saturation tend to be, tended to be processed before kind of another feature, for instance, and some of the color stuff you're looking at. Um, so I, I went to the literature and I, uh, wanted to know, well, okay, well, what could explain why that's consistently being processed first? And um, there wasn't anything there. So there's this whole set of ideas from computer science and operations research on scheduling theory. And the projects that I'm interested in now are trying to tease apart the what determines how people trade off kind of their effort and um, potential reward to determine how to prioritize doing different tasks. And I took a different approach with this rather than kind of approaching it from a theoretical basis, tried to look at well, what are the sorts of things that people do um, and make it more of a use inspired kind of project. And that's kind of where I think I'm going for the next period. So I have a question maybe related to that topic of prioritizing it. Once you told me something that really blew my mind, it was something like you have a spreadsheet and you use the value criteria, something like this to decide. Yeah. So the general question is, you know, how do how the things that you work on shape what you do in everyday life? Yeah, so one of, the, one of the things that happened as I became more senior is that I got more things to do, um, and more administrative things, things that take, took me away from research. Um, another really important change is that uh, my partner and I became um, kinship parents for her little sister, who's a, a now 14 years old, about two years ago. Um, so that's been, I sort of abruptly became a parent um, in a way that I didn't expect to. So I really had to figure out how to try to achieve things in an efficient kind of way. So what I did was I treated my research time like it was my bankroll. And there's this, uh, this idea from gambling that you can prioritize how to invest your bankroll in different gambles 
using something called the Kelly criterion, which balances, you know, what is the expected payoff against um, uh, the, the reward that you'll, you'll get. So I do, I have, I have a spreadsheet which lists kind of, you know, how much work do I have to do on this project? Um, what is the potential payoff from this project? I just use something like impact factor or grant or something like that. Grants are worth 10 uh, or maybe even more depending on how badly I want it. Um, it's kind of, the numbers are made up, but they, from that and applying the Kelly criterion, you get a ranking of the likelihood of success um, kind of multiplied by the potential payoff for each project. And then I can take that and allocate, you know, the whatever meager amount of time I have to do research on those projects. And it tends to prioritize projects which are closer to being published, um, unless there's a really high payoff, like a grant will get kind of popular there. And I, it's more of a heuristic thing. I don't update this all the time, but when I when I'm stuck for what I want to, so for thinking about well, what I want to work on now, I've got some time. I'll go look at it and kind of think like, well, okay, um, that, that is a good idea. I can make a little bit of progress on that and maybe push that a little bit closer. And that seems to have worked pretty well, um, at least in kind of keeping me on task, I think. So anybody's interested, I'm happy to kind of check it out. We'll finish up there. So um, thank you very much, Dan. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank you.